ladies and good afternoon and welcome to Meet the Artichoke Girls. This is Chris and today we are going to do the format slightly differently. Instead of just asking Chris 30 questions, we're going to do a proper interview because we're just looking at the cat who's walked in front of the camera or behind the camera. Uh, because Chris was a DCI in the Met, she's pointing now, we can all see you pointing, Christine. <laughs> now the cat's gone, we can relax. Uh, Chris was a DCI in the Met, working on murder squads and uh, in child protection. So we're going to have a little interview with her. Uh, obviously during lockdown she can't do an awful lot but um, normally uh, she has a second career now and she is a public speaker. She is the best one you will ever have. So ladies if any of you have do's for next year when we can finally congregate together I'm sure once you've listened to this um, you will agree that uh, Chris would be brilliant uh, to speak at your event. We are going to take questions as we go through the video, ladies. So um, if you want to type them out, um, I'll ask uh, Chris. And um, if she's not on a huge roll, uh, she can answer them. Otherwise, we will um, do it at the end. As always, push that love button. Uh, we need you to do that frantically because it helps us in Google land. Before I start asking Chris some questions, I just have to say that this is yet another friend of whom I have severe house envy. <laughs> All I'm doing is going around my mates, sitting in their gorgeous houses. So this is uh, Chris and Sandy's outside room. Can you believe it? It's fab. So, Chris, why did you join the police? Well, it's an interesting, interesting story why I joined the police. Um, I had initially really wanted to be a teacher and um, my father was very keen for me to join the police, not to teach. And consequently, I was actually going to revolt and be a teacher and he sadly died and I ended up joining the police basically through guilt. <laughs> but it's not actually something that I regret because um, I, did, I had a fantastic career out of it. and. Um, and I've seen an awful lot that you probably I probably wouldn't have seen had I been teaching. So, where exactly did you work? Well, I've worked in three police forces. I worked in um, Greater Manchester Police, the Met, and I worked in Norfolk. And it's very interesting because you you would believe that the police would be the same all the way through because the law's the same, but actually it's not. And the police forces are very different. They do have slightly different cultures and obviously the time frame depicts the culture as well as to how things are at a certain time. So they were quite different and, and both um, Greater Manchester was a sort of cross between Norfolk and the Met. The Met being very busy, uh, very diverse and then you come to Norfolk which is anything but. <laughs> And um, yeah, it, it was a very interesting contrast, all three of those forces. So when did you start then as a WPC? Well, started, did you have one of those glorious skirts? I did. <laughs> no. I had an A4 <laughs> skirt at the time and you still wore little black bull shoes. <laughs> and they eventually, during my time when I joined, um, they ended up doing the new bowler which was very nice. Until then, it was the, um, what was that, um, Jean, not Pratt, um, oh, um, what was the TV series? Yeah, well, George is watching it at the moment. The caps, a bit like Helen Mirren, yeah. they still had it when she started, so um, in Prime Suspect. So, yeah, so that the uniform was really draconian at the beginning. And when you actually got to wear trousers, you know, it was a real bonus. You were able to run after people then. <laughs> without having a tutu blow up in your face. And I know that there was a sort of an initiation thing about how to get promoted. <laughs> well, it isn't really how to get promoted. When you went to a new station, they would quite literally chase you to try and stamp your bottom with the gold stamp. <laughs> no. I was lucky enough never to let them catch me, I've got to tell you. Never. 
So, um, obviously not quite as politically correct as these days. <laughs> not, not at all. I mean, the contrast was enormous, really. Um, sexism was rife. They still, actually, when I joined, they'd only just changed from a policewoman's department to the women being part of the, the normal force. And even then, you would always end up looking after the kids. You know, you wouldn't get the sort of decent jobs if you like not saying that there's anything wrong with looking after children <laughs> i didn't join the police really to do that but there we are. So. right so you started off in manchester and um when did you become a detective was that when you were still in manchester yeah um in manchester i worked my way up so it took quite a while you would do at least your two years probationary period um in uniform and that would be um patrolling the streets, checking on properties, all that type of thing. And we did that at the same time as Peter Sutcliffe was out on the loose. We also covered the miners' strike. All the guys went to fight with the miners and the women were left patrolling the streets. So that was quite an interesting time in itself. And then from then on, um, you would then move forward and the question, I've lost you there. What were you? So when did you become a detective? So then, but we can move that, on from, from that. From the uniform, you then go into the CID via a crime squad, yeah. which is what I did. And I was in the CID in Greater Manchester. So going back to, that's what made me think, yeah. actually, when you mentioned Peter Sutcliffe, that must have been quite a frightening time to be working um, as a woman a police officer on the streets in Manchester. Yeah. yeah, they they had special we had special parades and um it was at the time um specifically when that tape had come out which actually was bogus but um so that that had been played um for part of our training in the probationary period not only Sutcliffe we had to listen to the Moore's murders tapes oh we can relax at the time so uh, Chris was a DCI in the Met working on I'm sorry I don't know what's happened <laughs> something's happened hang on what again what the hell is what happened? did you touch I think we're back on can you hear us ladies can you talk, Chris? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we're sorry yeah. about that. I've got absolutely no <laughs> idea what happened, but it all went very odd for a minute. And so I'm just about so to get my truncheon out. Uh, just again. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Yeah, go back to Peter Sutcliffe. Yeah. So there were special parades in relation to him, and it was a scary time. You had to be very careful if you were stopping cars, etc., because you would often patrol, particularly on foot, on your own. So um, I think everybody was very wary at that point in time. So you joined CID in Manchester. So what did you do sort of throughout the rest of your career? And did you act, do you actually have a favourite role? Well, when I left Manchester, I went to the Met and had to start all over again, which was unbelievable, really. But within about a couple of years, I managed to get onto um, a drug squad, an area drug squad. And that was a great that was great fun. The camaraderie with that team was super. You know, you would be following people, you'd be watching their houses, you'd be watching them supply drugs, both in the street and from the houses, people visiting, etc. You'd build a really good intelligence picture around them, and then you'd go and bosh the door down and arrest them all. So it really was great fun at the time and hopefully you get a really good prosecution at court. So that was good. And the guys I worked with there um, were great fun, real live wires. And then um, from then on, I then went from uh, seminary of drugs, um, became um, a detective shortly after that, which had taken some time, and then made the regional crime squad. There I got trained professionally in surveillance. And, uh, you know, you think of a career and, you know, how many careers can you legally drive at 120, 140 miles an hour and um, enjoy yourself doing that type of thing? Or if it's not your thing, you're probably not enjoying yourself, but I enjoy it. So, and you just ne would never know what was going to happen one day to the next, um, depending on what you were doing. So the regional crime squad was a great, great time. Um, and you make friends with um, people. I eventually ended up in the Met and the murder squads 
and some of the friends I've made from the murder squads, you know, we're still very good friends today. And and you stay, they stay with you. You get the best of people and the worst of people. So in relation to that type of thing, the, t the people you meet, you know, they're really special people. And I think it's the camaraderie. And also you're doing a job that no one else, unless you're in the job, can really appreciate, which makes it special. So you obviously worked hard. Did you play hard too? Oh, yeah. Is that yeah. why you're so knackered now? Oh, it is. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Um, you would, um, particularly on the murder teams, if you ended up having a good arrest or you got a good result at court, you'd end up having a great big lunch. And, I mean, it would start at lunchtime, which would be bang on 12, and, and it would probably go through to the next lunchtime sometimes if it was a good one, you know. And um, it was great fun. Um, and that I don't know if that goes on as much these days, but that was the sort of territory you were in at that point in time, um, which was a good few years ago now, 10, 20 years ago. So I'm not sure how much of that happens nowadays because they've got to be so careful with social media now. Yeah, and I think actually the culture across a lot of industries has changed because before I had the kids I worked for a shipping country company in Essex and I mean we used to stop work a Friday lunchtime and all go down the pub yeah yeah and actually a lot of business was done in the pub mm -hmm. but the culture it was completely acceptable then just to disappear at midday and never come back again. And I just don't think that that would be accepted on any level now, no, I would don't it? I think it would. I mean, I, I, I was attached to um, the, the Serious Fraud Squad for a long time. And um, they introduced me to Bushmills whiskey, although yeah. ironically my mother comes from Bushmills, and Black Bush, all of this. And that was all on a Friday afternoon. And how I got home some of those Fridays, I do not know. <laughs> no, no. I think we've all been there and made <laughs> yeah. that movie, but don't tell my children. <laughs> so, my love, you were working in the Met, you're now in the murder squad. So what is the highest profile case you think that you have worked on? One that all our, um, all our artichoke girls may have heard of. Well, there's a number. Um, when I was on the murder squads, I did a lot of reviewing of serious crime. And um, two of the jobs I did an internal review for my boss for prior to them going to um, a mainstay review. One was the Rachel McKell job in, in Wimbledon, where she was um, dreadfully stabbed many, many times by Colin Stagg, so it was believed, which was totally wrong. And the other um, job that I did an internal review for my boss was the Jill Dando job which is still open and obviously I wouldn't want to talk about that case really um, except to say um, it was a dreadfully sad case and um, the paramedics left very little scene to, to work with which I think has made the job that that case very difficult. Um, the Rachel McKell case was a very difficult case that internal review kept, put up two suspects um, and then they carried out a major review um, making a massive paper mache model of Wimbledon Common and working out where people were, doing time and motion studies, etc. And from that, they ended up with the mainstay suspect. Um, and after he was arrested, it turned out he was a suspect for numerous, numerous awful rapes across London. Um, so that was a, a, a bit of a... I think we dropped the ball there, really. Mm. And um, luckily... You know, going on the ten-year anniversary, they did pick. We did pick it up again, but it cost them an awful lot of money. They made some very basic mistakes, didn't yeah, they? Very, um, very poor scene management. They made the crime fit the scene, if you like, or, mm. or the scene fit the crime, um, without actually just following the evidence. Which, if they'd done that, it would have been they'd have been far better off, really. And actually, probably would have saved a lot more women, oh. a lot of misery and damaged. Yeah. A, a far fewer lives because he would have been caught a lot earlier well he was actually when he was caught he was already in prison oh okay because they had caught him for one of the rapes but it was only then that it had started to transpire how many others because of the dna evidence which has pushed things forward immensely so. mm. right ladies so if you've got any uh questions for chris just um fire them at me um, we are going to um, continue with our little chat. 
Um, and my next question, having asked you what is the highest profile case you have ever worked on, what has been the most challenging? Well, the most challenging for me isn't actually a case, but it was when you, um, and I haven't had to do many, uh, and I think most people pray they don't have to do many, and that's delivering a death message. And um, I've done a number in my service, and it, it's a tragic thing to have to do. And you never quite know how people are going to react, because some people just break down, some people become quite violent and, and blame you because you're the messenger. Um, and it's all very, very difficult. And I, and I think, I think within me sometimes there's a, there's a thought process around destiny. And, so, and I know this sounds ridiculous, but I do believe the right person gets given the right death message for that, for that family. Um, but that was probably one of the hardest things to, to have to do, really. Yeah, it must be very, very harrowing, actually. Very sad. And it's the same when you deal with um, the relatives of murder victims, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, you have to be truthful with them. And sometimes that can be horrendous, what, what they end up knowing or being told. And, and that can be really difficult. And, and those are the things that you have to really think clearly about how you're going to pass that message on, how you're going to tell them what's happened in in the most tactful way you can and when you're as untactful as me it's really really hard and <laughs> no. to work very hard to perfect that <laughs> and actually murder is still such a taboo isn't it you know i uh, having had a cousin murdered to this day i still don't really know what happened because the immediate family you don't want to mither them and they don't want to talk about it. Um, it's just an awful, awful situation that reverberates not through the immediate family, but actually has a profound impact on a lot of people surrounding them, doesn't it? And the fear and everything that that sort of induces, particularly when it's a woman that's killed and you're a woman. It really is. You've never told me about that, actually. Have you? Oh, no. I'm surprised you've never mentioned that. But, yeah, it, it is really difficult. And um, and people's reactions vary immensely, you know, and you can never gauge someone's reaction. And that's why I think it becomes so difficult. Um, you, you just have to try and uh, react to the situation as quickly as you can, which sometimes can be really difficult. Mm. So those of you who've just joined us, what we're doing today is we're talking to one of our artichoke girls, one of our favourite ones. Rather than following the normal format of 30 questions, because Chris has had such an amazingly interesting career, we're doing this little interview with her. So if you've only just started watching, hang on with us. Um, and then rewind at the end, because we're about halfway through now. Um, I haven't had any questions. You need to ask me <laughs> questions, women. Right, so my next question to you, Chris, is obviously you were a woman in a man's world, but what was it like being a gay woman in a man's world? That must have been quite odd, actually, at times, especially at the beginning, I would have thought. Really difficult. I mean, when I first joined, um, it was just difficult enough being a woman in a man's world and consequently um, I wasn't I didn't come out for many many years actually and it wasn't until I was in the Met that I came out and even then that was well into the 1990s and then I'd been in the police for way over 15 16 years so you know um, but it wasn't easy and um, you were worried about being judged and in those days, in the early days, you didn't get the silent treatment. You would get all sorts of comments, you know, about being queer, about this, about that. So consequently, you wouldn't really say anything. And yet, people would have their suspicions anyway. So you would get these awful comments that you'd have to sort of either just dismiss, really, or else, or else front it up. And a lot of the time, I just chose to dismiss it because it, work was work. And I wasn't really interested in sharing my private life 
with the people I worked with unless I chose to. So mm. it was very, very diffi difficult. And then you came to Norfolk. Yes, and it still remained very, very difficult. <laughs> always laugh about this because clearly Chris and Sandy before they came here had no idea what Norfolk was like. <laughs> Why on earth did you imagine? <laughs> what is the programme? <laughs> What's the programme? Is it Matt Lucas, the only gay in the village? Oh Matt yeah. Oh well, no, gay. that's just been banned. I know. I know. <laughs> oh, there we have it. <laughs> so are you still only the only gay in the village? You got a bloody great big air base next to you. I have some suspicion <laughs> you're not. Um, anyway, Tracy's just asked: diamonds or pearls? <laughs> diamonds or pearls? <laughs> Diamonds. Diamonds. Definitely she went diamonds. for diamonds as well. <laughs> diamonds uh, and Tracy's wallpaper. <laughs> <laughs> right, so um, now you must have a lot of funny stories. Have you got a favourite one or two that you can share with us? A favourite one or two. I've got quite an interesting one, which... Uh. Um, I will share, but you can't tell anyone about it, So, but I'll share it. Many, many years ago, when I was in um, the police in Stockport, my friend and I, who shall be called Tony, I can't give you his second name, I was in my probation still, so I was very much under his command and he was looking after me, if you like. And one day, we were making our early morning breakfast. It was in the middle of the night, about 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. And we were working in Reddish, and at that point we were in a mobile home. That's the station, because they were building it around us. And um, we heard all this noise, and Tony was frying up the, our breakfast and everything. And I went to investigate, and as I got into the ladies' loo, which is where all the noise was coming from, there was a little black man had just come through the window. And he was quite tall, about five foot eight, with his afro hair, very, very skinny. Big, big eyes, is it, uh, really, you know, pretty high on drugs. And he said, hello, hello, how are you? And I said, hello, how are you? And where, where did you come from? Because you're in the wrong place in a police station. So he, he sort of said, oh, I, I'm, I'm in a police station. So I sort of said, stay there, close the door and call Tony. Tony came and I said, Tony, Tony, now I'm young then, very young and naive and quite, you know, very, well, I'm honest anyway, but very, very honest. I said, Tony, Tony, we're going to have to arrest him. There's something wrong with him. I th he's, bur he's coming to burglars. He didn't realise it's the police station. Tony said, no, 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 don't be so stupid. Now, hold the door shut. Don't let him get back out. So I had to hold the door. Tony went, turned off all the breakfast, grabbed the panda car keys, grabbed him, and off we went. He shoved him in the back of the panda. So we're on our way. And I said, you're going the wrong way. We're not going to the police station. He said, I know that. Just be quiet. Just be very, very quiet. And this will be over in a minute. Now, this man in the back kept saying, I am not arrested. You have not arrested me. I am not arrested. You have not arrested me. And I was thinking, oh, my God. You know, and I was saying, Tony, Tony. And he was saying, Christine, don't ask any more questions. So he drove us over the border into Levenjoo, which was Levenjoo then. We were in Stockport. And we stopped the car. He pulled up a road, a side road. And he let this man out. Didn't even take his details, nothing. And I said, Tony... What are you doing? He was going to burgle the police station. So he said, it doesn't matter. Now you, he said to him, on your bike, don't come back or else you're going to get arrested. We haven't got time for you tonight. We're too busy. You are too busy. You are too busy cooking your breakfast. We know that, man. We know that. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. You know, so I, he got shunted off. We closed the panda car's doors. Tony said, get back in. I said, I'm really uncomfortable about this. No, 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 you're not. Get in and let's come back. So we go back and we start, and he said, I'm going to finish our breakfast, going to sit down, put the tea on. So I made the tea, he finished it. I'm sitting down and I'm saying, Tony, I'm really, no, don't. Now, I really trusted Tony. He was a really good policeman. So I thought, OK. I'm like, I said, OK, I won't worry about it. Do not worry about it. Do not say a word to anyone. I said, OK, I won't. So we're eating our breakfast and it's now about half past three, probably, in the morning. And all of a sudden we get an alarm call. Yeah, Juliet. Juliet 2-1, are you receiving? So that's us. So Tony replies, yes, yes. Could you go to um, Stockport Road, Stockport Road, border with Levenjoo, burglary in place, alarm going at the garage there, garage there that's empty. 
So I said, Tony, and he went, don't even think about it. Get in the car. So we go shooting round. My God, he's there. He's burgled a massive petrol station, which is empty. He's stood in the... And, well, he's not. He stood in the petrol station where the till is, opening the till. And I'm looking at Tony, and Tony's saying, if you mention a word, <laughs> Anyway, we got in there, he grabbed him. He, this time he gets arrested, mm. and he gets taken to the police station, whereupon he keeps saying, do you know, I have seen these today. I was in there, people, <laughs> and And they did not arrest me. They let me go. <laughs> I'm looking at Tony, and Tony is looking at me like, if you say a word, I will kill you. And, he, and, the, and my, the custody sergeant is saying to me, Christine, what is all this? I said, I don't know, I think he must be a bit mad. Tony's saying, he's a lunatic, he's a lunatic. Well, should we section him? And this carried on anyway. Uh, the upshot is, he was sectioned in the end because he was a bit of a, a loony, basically. But um, he did get sorted out and looked after and got taken to hospital, etc. But that was a learning for me, and oh my god, it was just, you couldn't believe it. it was just you couldn't like make it up. Penny. You couldn't make it <laughs> no, up. No, you couldn't. Like, oh my <laughs> so yeah, so that was one of the things that happened that I wish hadn't really, but there we are. <laughs> so Donna's watching. Um, Donna, you asked a question earlier, so I'm going to ask that now. But think of another one that you want to ask Chris because we were talking about it yesterday and I've forgotten what you wanted to ask her. But anyway, Donna wants to know if you think she would make a good detective because she feels she's missed out on her career. Um, initially, she thought she might be Cagney or Lacey, but these days she thinks she's more like Vera. What do you think? Well, Donna, I think that's a, a very, very interesting question. <laughs> no. and Donna's say, saying, I hope she doesn't laugh. I've got to say, when you first would have joined the police, I think you perhaps may have been a little bit small and you might not have made the height restriction. But apart from that, I'm sure that they have a tortoise section and I think you would be excellent in it. Excellent, Donna. A very, very good, good policewoman you would have made. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> so, you moved up to Norfolk and um, have since retired from the police force. What do you... Oh, she just said, us shorties are tough. <laughs> so, what is it you love about living here in Norfolk? Um... I've, what I love about Norfolk is the lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm. We've got a fantastic house that we enjoy. The fact that you can be half an hour from the beach. Um, really nice places. Most of the places to eat. Um, we eat at Stratton's um, at Coco's, which we love, and we're really missing that. Um, and it's really good produce. And, and Rob's um, Scottsfield pork. Stuff like that. And I really don't think, you, you know, you get that. To, uh, that product, such a good product, um, down in London. I really don't, because I don't think the provenance is there, even though they may say it is. Mm. But we actually love the lifestyle. It is a little bit manana, mm. which actually, if you're here to retire or to just enjoy life, it, it's perfect, really. And I've recently started playing golf again, and I'm really beginning to enjoy that. And uh, all in all, um, life's pretty good here. I mean, if you look at us at the minute on lockdown with our R rate, as Sarah informs me, mm. we're doing extremely well. So yeah, it's eight people uh, per nine hundred thousand, and four of them are in Lynn, and the other four are in Yarmouth. <laughs> That's a Norfolk joke. I'm not responsible for that. <laughs> and Donna said you forgot to mention artichoke. Oh well. <laughs> That goes without saying, doesn't it? With my with my clothes, my stark jeans, my blouse from Sarah. You know, and the clothing shop's fantastic. But Sarah knows that because we buy most of our clothes from here. Yeah, she feeds my children and so does her wife Sandy fairly regularly. <laughs> <laughs> so Christine, if you had your time again, would you join the police? I think in ret in retrospect, I probably would because no matter what you do in the police, usually, no day, no two days are the same. So you get a really good 
introduction to life, you get a great social um, enterprise, if you like, of seeing the different sides of life, different people. You see the best of people, you see the worst of people. Um, you know, one day you can be travelling at 120 miles an hour, another day you can be stood on a crime scene, another day you can be fishing a body out of a canal. Uh, they're all things, some of them aren't pleasant, but they're still experiences that I don't think you get in many other jobs. And um, from that point of view, it's a really good career. So is the answer yes? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed, Chris. Um, thank you, J uh, James. Where did that come I've from? No idea. No, James, James. I've got no idea. No, no. She's trying to be politically correct and <laughs> transgender. I'm sorry, that's not me. Maybe. I'm... Well, that's completely thrown me. Where the bloody hell did James I've come no from? <laughs> joining us thank you ladies for joining us i hope that you've enjoyed our little um interview with chris joe's just said good career i agree because joe is another customer of ours who uh, lives in ely and she was in the police force as well um, I think it's about time for us to sign off. If you think of any questions later, pop them in the comments and I'll ask Chris to answer them. Yeah. Because we are on 4G and the Gs aren't great here in Norfolk, I may well have missed them. So thanks for joining us. Uh, Sunday is going to be Sunday styling and what I'm going to do is I am going to show you how to style a pair of white jeans in lots of different ways um, and all from this season's collection at Artichoke. Donna's just given us too much information. She said she, she'll she play catch up if she got carried away with the hoover. We know you're lying. <laughs> And Melissa Furness has just said, wonderful, Chris. Oh, thank you, Melissa. So, ladies, I hope you enjoyed this. And as you can see, being with Chris is a huge amount of fun. And perhaps we'll ask her back in the autumn to come up with some more stories. And Tracy's just said, thanks, Chris, as well. I hear they speak. They got some lovely wallpaper with you yesterday, Tracy. And I've seen that amazing uh, zebra print. <laughs> Sally's been showing it to me, yeah. <laughs> All I've got to do is decorate that house, rebuild it, and I too can have a zebra print. But none of you hold your breath. Anyway, ladies, see you at 10 o'clock on Sunday. Bye-bye, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Now we can't go away, having lost you halfway through. <laughs> Just talk amongst yourselves whilst I try and get... <laughs> You I can't finish. Bye bye. Do I can't. I can't make it go away. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Which? Oh my God! It still hasn't finished. <laughs> We've got no idea how to finish this video because the phone's not working. I don't know how to. <laughs> Right, you might be here all night. Do the sunny thing. Just turn the phone off. Oh, I don't know how to turn the phone off. Right. Still live. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Can somebody tell us what to do if you're still watching? <laughs> you must be able to stop it. Finish. No, it's not working. Okay.